Yo, yo. What up? What up? Yo. What up? What up? Hey. Hey, welcome. Welcome to Benny's crib. What up? Oh, uh, yeah, just leave your shoes over there. It's cool. Yeah, thanks. Does that sound cool? Yo. Yo, what up? Welcome to Benny's crib. And we are back, folks. It's been a it's been a long two weeks here. Excuse me, two months. Um, here at the crib without an interview, and I'm excited for today's podcast because we really have a, a guest that uh, has done a lot out here in the scene, multiple endeavors out here on the scene. Um. Regardless of the Omerion variant, delaying this podcast a little bit, um, we back, you know, it's all about rolling with the punches, and this week I'm excited to introduce this next guest, a Portland DJ, a main producer, an artist out here doing it in the land of Dirigo, DJ Matt Perry, how we doing? Yo, what's up, Benny's Crib? Man, it's such a pleasure to be here. I love the energy you bring to the scene, man, and I'm just excited to hang out with you, and talk about some some music and some life stuff you know hell yeah thank you man for real for real like i said um we took a little holiday break from the podcast and we had a lot of covid setbacks so appreciate everyone at home uh watching and listening and supporting for your patience and uh we're back with uh the question we always got to start every interview every podcast with tj matt perry what's your first memory of hip-hop man that's uh I feel like I was probably exposed to it before I knew I was being exposed to it. Mm, mm. You know? I definitely listened to a lot more like rock and roll growing up. I wonder hip hop. Man, that's it can even be a like a, question. you know, th- early ish memories. You know, too. one of my cousins who who died young, unfortunately, mm. um, he told me one time, he's like, dude, you you don't know who Tupac is? And I was like, No. Oh shit! I don't know, calling Tupac. you out. Hey, mic up like just a touchy bit. Uh, Perfect thing. I mean, he's looking out for you. You know, you gotta know who Tupac is. Yeah, and it probably took me like five years after that to figure out who Tupac was because I was like nine at the time. Mm. He's like, you don't, you don't listen to Tupac and Biggie, dude. Like, you don't understand anything. Mm. I'm like, all right, well, you know, I figured out eventually who they were. Um, but in that in that moment, it was it was kind of funny because I looking back i just it sounded like a foreign language to me i was like i have no idea what what this is um yeah man and then i think the stuff i really first got into the song uh called sleep awake by soul crate it's just this random like underground song yeah so sick it's just like sick grooving hip-hop record that one i probably listened to like four thousand times you know that that was one of those records that just like cut through for some reason just a random song that just hit the right feeling, you know? I think my friends pushed me into being a hip-hop producer, to be honest. I wanted to make electronic music. Yeah, well, you, I would even say, like, to the folks at home who, who aren't privy to uh, Matt's work and his music, you do hip-hop, some pretty, like, hardcore electronic music that's pretty heavy. Um, you know, some people like would call that, I guess, like, you know, more like trap. I think of, like, T.I. when I think about, like, trap music. So I guess everyone has got their definitions, but... Um, and even like I was gonna say, some of your songs are poppy and R and B influenced too. So I think you're more like an eclectic sound, but you definitely do have hip hop in, in your sound for sure. Yeah, oh, f- oh, hundred percent. If that was an accurate statement. Oh, for yeah. sure. I appreciate that. That's cool, man. You know, I I love not fitting into a box like, um, and and making different music. And since I mostly have been producing for other artists, mm. I tend to like do more chameleon style mm-hmm. you know i'm kind of oh, like yeah. i like this summer i worked with like a like a sad girl artist i don't know how else to describe it but <laughs> it was just like no no upbeat stuff at all which i mm. wasn't used to because mm. everything i produced was mostly inspired from working in the clubs and mm. like it's super drum heavy yeah, yeah. you know like a lot of bass lots of bass higher tempo usually yeah and so i this this was the first artist i really made like sad girl music with and it was what is in your in your definition what is sad girl i mean you know slow down tempo minor stuff specifically talking about being sad Mm, and and the lyrics and shit yeah Yeah, for sure just super super sad girl 
Um, and and actually, one hip hop artist I've been working with a lot is Ahmad Khan, mm. and he's from Pakistan mm. originally. Um, but he raps in three languages. He raps That's in sick. Pashto, which is uh, spoken in like Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, also in Hindi and in uh, Farsi, which is the Persian language. Um, and and he also raps in English, which like in four so in four languages, languages yeah. he's rapping in. Shoo. And like, it's so cool working in other languages because I don't know a lot of times the meaning, mm. but I can hear all the syllables and mm. like the transients. And the way the sounds are shaped. Mm. And so I tend to just hear it more like, oh, this is very sharp or this is this like flow was super sick. I don't know what you said, but like mm. and he's always talking about cool conscious yeah. stuff. And like rhythm is universal, you know, it's like it's not it's, it's a language that everyone kind of understands regardless of what written or oral language, you know, I feel like. Yeah. And some some musicians say that rhythm is more important than melody. I, I believe that also, and a lot of what is going on in popular music is like this groove-based stuff. We're like, sure, you, we need mm. melody, but like, guys, let's be honest, we all want the 808 bass to slap yeah. super hard. We, you know, we just, we want that like rhythm and that feeling. Definitely. But yeah, it's, it's too early. I don't even know if I want to have this conversation on the podcast, but it's very reminiscent of the, what's more important, the rap or the beat in a song. Right. But. Let's not have that. We're, we're about uh, the DJ Matt Perry story. And I want to go back to the beginning, in a sense, because I mentioned the first memory of hip-hop. Um, but like, Where are you from? Like, What do you what do you kind of claim as like your hometown? I'm from North Yarmouth, for sure. Grew You're up, a Yarmouth guy. Grew up in the woods. Nice. Um, my house is, like, surrounded by trees. Same. So that yeah. was lit growing up, like, with salamanders and like crayfish. That. Whoa, you got the cool, you there got was, exotic shit up on yeah, your Yeah, there was like a little stream behind my house and there was crayfish in there. That's pretty sick. Did they're they're mini lobsters. lobsters, yeah. They're, they're pretty sick. Did you cook them? I never ate them. I feel you. I if I was a kid, I probably wouldn't take them out and eat them. Like either. now, I probably would. I probably would. Like, but I think for some reason they're gone. Like I haven't been able to find them in the stream. I don't know if they are. R.I.P. Like, to the crawfish and DJ Matt Perry's yeah. childhood creek. <laughs> they're gone. <laughs> Moment of silence. Yeah. <laughs> It wasn't really a moment of silence. All right, well, <laughs> we've talked about foraging in creeks and playing in woodland settings, but uh, did you have any other hobbies as a youth? I mean, I really liked hanging out in the woods for some reason. I would, like, I build, build forts out there and shit and mm. just, like, um, kind of just play around with stuff. Like, I don't know, you could build a lot of stuff and then just leave it, and it's fine. Like, 100%. there's not a ton of responsibilities. I really liked playing sports too. Um, mm. I played lacrosse a lot as a kid. That was probably like my favorite sport. Just mm. throwing the ball against like the wall, or I think I broke a couple windows in my house. I can see that. I literally <laughs> yeah. know nothing about lacrosse, but uh, it looks like there's a lot of uh, hand-eye coordination involved. Yeah, and the the ball you use is rubber, but it's really heavy. Yeah, it's not like a racquetball. It's like it's like ten times. It's like a that. rock. Yeah, it's freaking dense. It's a rock. If you get hit with that thing, you're getting a huge bruise. Yeah, like, I would imagine like getting hit like on the calf, getting like a Charlie horse maybe too. If you get hit up on like the leg, I wouldn't feel good. <laughs> yeah, that would hurt. Oh. So sports, the outdoors. Um, I play guitar too. When that's I was perfect a little segue because I wanted to ask about maybe um if music was around in your upbringing. Yeah, I had like a cheap little shout out to my parents i had a cheap little acoustic guitar that I, I was too small to play it like traditionally so i put it just put it on my lap and just would play it with my fingers um like hendrix at fucking woodstock maybe yeah uh, yeah well, not at that caliber right right but, but you know one string at a time <laughs> i wasn't like pressing the frets or anything but i think that was enough just to like kind of spark the imagination and yeah. my parents aren't musical mm -hmm. but they really wanted, I have, I have four siblings, and they wanted all of us to be in music. So we had to join band as young kids. Where did you rank in the age order? I'm the second oldest. Second oldest, sweet. So you had, oh, and you said you had cousins too. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like maybe older people in your family who were more in your age bracket were more influential in the music department than your parents were. Yeah. Well, I guess your parents technically did push you, though, to be a musician in the first place, right? Or yeah. be in band, I guess. Yeah, yeah, my parents wanted me to play trumpet, and I played trumpet for a while. Did you like the trumpet? Uh, at the time, not really. 
because I was kind of forced to do it. I, I played electric guitar too at the same time, and I was in a mm. band, and I was like, "This is way cooler." Yeah, like, is band cool. is lame, you know. Nice. How fast was it when you picked up guitar to you getting into a band or forming a band with like your homies? Um, you know, Sean Greer, who lives across the street from me. Wait, like growing up? Yeah. Oh, this makes sense then. Yeah. All right, we'll get to Sean Greer and advert. It's. I want to get this from the jump too. It's ad versus FX, right? Yeah, adverse effects. But it, it sounds like adverse effects almost. Like I'm like I'm saying A D V E R S A E F or E F F E T S. You know right. what I'm saying? No, that that's the, yeah. Adverse effects is the right way to pronounce it. Yeah. It, yeah, I mean, and the word adverse effects is means like something bad, kind of. Yeah. Like an unintended consequence. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Exactly. Um. But that's the name of Sean and I's electronic music duo. Yeah, that's so wild. So you guys are from across the street? Yeah, bro. He taught me guitar. Oh, shit. He, was he in that band? Yeah. So Sean Sean was the first person Probably who I really that, yeah. played guitar with. And his his dad played guitar. Um, and we would, like, jam together. And they were nasty. And I was so <clears> shitty <throat> compared to them. Mm. And, like, they would just be shredding on the guitars. <laughs> and I'm just, like, dinking along playing one string. Mm. Um but that that was really I think I pretty much started writing songs right away before I when I was a young kid. You mm. know what I mean? Just Yeah, like, what age were you when you picked up the guitar? I rem- I remember writing a song at 3 years old and That's it was it was just on open strings. It's just like, you know, open strings on the guitar, That's but early. um and then I I got a little piano, like a cheap little Casio piano in mm-hmm. middle school and I started like writing songs on that. Mm. Um, and, and I joined a band like kind of more traditional rock, like kind of soft rock sounding band with like drums, bass, electric guitar and singing. Mm. Um, yeah. And that was, that was really like the first real, like I would say like outside of music, outside of school mm. music that I was doing. Cause we were like trying to release our stuff on MySpace, mm. and, you know, I was actually producing the albums then and like recording them and mixing them and, and i didn't and even what, know uh, the garage band or when what i i pirated adobe edition Ooh. yeah and i had that oh, you said in middle school you're doing this yeah it's pretty fun yeah it That's was pretty fun it was cool man and it was fun i was using a little like like a laptop mic mm. to record everything yeah, like, like, the, like the, the in the in laptop mic <laughs> it, it was yeah. actually like a one you know you has had a button on it it was probably like 10 bucks. That's so more I mean, official. Yeah. You're playing some breath for that. It was cool. I, th- I felt legit. <laughs> oh, definitely. That's pretty interesting. What's your age now? I'm 27. 27. Same. I'm also allegedly 27 in, in human years. Right. There's dog years. That's uh, That's just one of the organisms. You know, like 400 and what, something. What's like a pistol shrimp year? You know what the pistol shrimp be? Those are the ones that do the one-inch punch and like kill people. <sighs> yeah. Right. And I think they can see... Uh, I might have already talked about this on the podcast, but it's one of my favorite organisms on the planet to discuss because it's they can see like maybe like eight to ten different colors that humans can't see, and they have that little like gun weapon that keep that thing on them twenty four seven, and they're, they're born them, with it, and they're bottom of the ocean pretty much just crawling around having fun. It's like why? How do they perceive time? We don't have to think about this. I don't want to get into a rabbit hole. How how how, how small are they? That's a good question. If I guessed that, I'd say they're probably like tip of the claw to the back of the tail, maybe like half this this table, like maybe like oh, they're big. I mean, they're not like like huge in like their width. I think they're just kind of like longer. Cause think about like claws, like the length of your hand or something. Yeah, maybe more like the length of your hand. I'm not a uh, marine biologist, so don't take my word for this shit. But in time, what what's like one year to them? Does it feel the same as one year to us? Regardless, we're both 27. In, yeah. in, in our rotations in, in shrimp around years the we're at least a million years old I think so maybe yeah. one maybe they slow down to, I don't even know I wanted to really just more ask was Sean older than you or is he the same age Sean's a little bit older yeah but I think an interesting segue in so the extra colors that yeah. those shrimps see I wonder what they are you, you can't you, you can't, know you like, and I like, can't even potentially think like about that trying to create that is so is so cool and that's something that we're always trying to do with music is like 
push it into a place maybe where it's never gone before. The unknown, yeah. Yeah, and it's so exciting to do that. It's also frustrating. <laughs> it's really hard if you want to... I think when you can pull from the unknown and then release into the unknown, meaning like you're kind of just trusting intuition and then giving the intuition back to the universe, it's not an easy thing to do. I think it comes with a lot more like anxieties perhaps and not necessarily overthinking, but it's when you're, when you're in zones like that, they're not like as comforting as other zones and you're not really playing it safe. And I think when you play it safe, you can kind of get like that mental facade that what you're doing is like really simple, but you're really just kind of like shooting yourself in the foot. Cause I think everything in life is complex. And when you lean into that, like unknown complexity, you really can feel like that really cathartic relationship to what you're doing instead of kind of just feel like you're skating by, if that makes sense. You know Man, that, yeah. that's so true. It's I, someone recently, like a coach I was talking to was saying, if you can do face adversity first thing in the morning, yeah, it's going to minimize your anxieties and depressions. That's, that's true. Because you're not going to be anxious in line if you've, you know, overcome some huge obstacle in the morning. I mean, I wake up anxious on, and know? depressed some mornings, like, and it's like a battle, not like a, you know, friggin' all day battle. I mean, I guess some people that definitely it is, but for me, like I can spend a good 10, 20, like even like half an hour in bed, like tossing and turning, like thinking about what I want to do that day. And then realizing a lot of the thoughts come from like lack of confidence or fear or anxiety, or even, you know, like a depression, seasonal depression, generational depression, whatever it may be. And I realize I'm like, shit, like these thoughts are going to be here, I think, all day, regardless of what I do or what I don't do. So if I try, try to take care of myself and make the best actions for myself, I feel like these feelings I have with it, not that they're easy, but the easiest to manage out of any state I'm in. That's what I've kind of learned. I'm like, face this shit head on and be like, all right, you're going to have these thoughts all day. You're not going to believe in yourself, even though you've done this shit a million fucking times, regardless of what it could be. It could be like just going to the gym or doing a new art endeavor. But I think once you have those conversations, like you said, like right when you wake up, you can be like, all right, life is tough, but I'm going I'm to I'm I'm face it and just do my best and shit pretty much. Yeah, let me tackle the most difficult thing first. Yeah, the self. <laughs> master or trying to master the self. You can't ever master it. But Man, discovering self is like, whoa, yeah, that's holy whole... smokes, I'm a human. There, yeah. are, there are consequences and, and things I must do. Whoa, I'm, I'm alive and <laughs> holy shit, I can break things. I'm responsible <laughs> for my actions. Yeah. The fuck is this? Yeah. <laughs> um, hell yeah. Well, I don't know how much more I have to say about different times and different mental fortitudes but the beautiful thing about this podcast is these types of deeper discussions flow in between more artistic discussions too right even though shit really is art shit at the end of the day it's all art stuff because i wanted to keep talking about your upbringing in like a musical sense because like you said you were in this band at this time mostly playing guitar piano a little bit but right now in this area i feel like i more personally know your music for uh djing and producing right i want to start to segue into that slowly um what came first as a musician djing or producing it sounds like you might have had arty elements with um that adobe program yeah producing definitely was was there and i then chose it um before djing like mm. i think mm. maybe i was f like 15 or 16 somewhere in high school where i was like all right I'm going to start producing music, electronic music. Right. And, yeah. and I think that was, that was the decision was like, I'd always been writing music, but now I'm going to produce electronic music. Mm, specifically. And, yeah. Specifically of the guitar electronic. Stuff. And like, I wasn't recording any guitar or drums. Then it was all just stuff in the computer. Mm, mm. And it was really fucking hard. Like I, you know, I post my stuff on SoundCloud and it was like half as loud as everybody else's. But my on my master bus, it shows that it's clipping. Yeah. But it's so quiet. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Yeah. What time? What time is this? Is this still in middle school or high school? This was in high school when I started, because I only ever was recording band stuff in middle school, mm. and then in high school I started doing electronic music. Mm. Um, and Sean again to you know Sean and I have really had a lot in our musical journeys together but he showed me electronic music and i thought it was just whack like i think it was this band called electric universe and it was so boring to me 
I thought it just didn't evolve at all. It was like very dead sounding and mm-hmm. sterile. Sounded like a robot made it. Um, I really wasn't into it. I think I was like, oh, cool, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. But then later, this band Infected Mushroom, I heard the song called Heavyweight by mm. Infected Mushroom, and that is totally alive, like wicked, you know, dynamic mm-hmm. and like the parts are are super fresh and and everything about the way they were manipulating that song was like so mystifying to me Mm -hmm. i just i i wanted i really wanted to be able to create something like that and was still producing electronic music i probably had maybe finished like five or six songs by the time i started djing so it wasn't like they they were pretty close to each other Mm. And I threw some shows at my high school and I DJed them. And I was literally like in my room, like tapping my foot, being like, what the fuck do people dance to? Like, I don't know how to, is this a dance song? Like, is this a dance song? Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, it was actually the, the school parties went really well just because like, it like was, they were like at school, you said, right? No, it was like, it was, it was like promoted through the school kind of, but it was like a high school party like for the public, but oh, at a different location. That's pretty interesting. And like you, I did you would, one at Pearl. And you would, and this was in high school. When you in started, high school, I threw a party at Pearl. So that's pretty funny. So you started <laughs> DJing and producing both at the same kind of time period in yeah. high school. Yeah. Almost like one to help the other maybe in a exactly. sense. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Bro. That is really interesting. I wanted to um, talk more again about uh, influences as a producer. Hmm. Specifically, that'd be cool with you. Just any names or artists, acts that come to mind. Dude, definitely Infected Mushroom is one of my most major influences Mm. and in particular their song heavyweight um it sounds like this like epic kind of story almost Mm -hmm. you know it's like it feels like it has characters and like chapters and it really evolves whereas some some other electronic music to me felt very boring and sterile infected mushroom was like holy shit these guys are pushing the boundaries. It clicked. Like, it was just so fucking cool, you know? And and then also the Glitch Mob, they were... Is that Glitch Hop? Yeah, exactly. And one of their producers, Edit, made this album called More Lasers. And there's this one record on there called Straight Heat. And it's just like, it's such a cool combination of electronic music with like hip hop Mm. but it's like you know it's like kind of punk and like Mm. anti-system and it's like feels you know like as as a rebellious kind of like late teenager Mm. you know it really felt good for me like this like really like loud aggressive music you know and it's kind of in your face too Mm. it's like the sounds are very crunchy and like big (laughs) and it's just like it just really knocks your car sound system you Mm. know and that type of stuff has kind of always been what i've wanted to create is just like this up tempo you know really drum heavy bass heavy type of music and yeah man even daft punk like going way back like you know that song around the world oh yeah like oh yeah they just have like they just have some classics that are trans thing about daft punk is they could they were popping off when they dropped if there's still hopefully like you know clubs and functions and parties 100 years from now that shit's still gonna work it just it just has a timeless i think language about it oh dude and and their their most recent album that they put out random access memories yeah, i think that was, was what 2013 maybe? yeah, yeah well, good and i think it, i think it won a grammy that year too for album of the year uh, probably mastered yeah. by bob ludwig over here in portland yeah maine, man got crazy. something to say yeah, um, forget. that is like such a great example of how artists can evolve too because like their their music that they started off as like very electronic you know kick drum sort of on the metronome like mm. you know 120 beats per minute or whatever mm. and then their new their random access memories was like all oh, real guitar and like it felt like a real drummer i don't know if it was or not but like mm. it was 
so organic and real, but it still like had the same feeling. Mm. I don't man, I just skateboarded around the whole summer with like a camelback and a little Bluetooth speaker, just bumping random access memories. Uh, that was the a good shit, summer. Bro. I remember that summer. It was the get lucky summer, you know. Yeah, everybody was hoping. <laughs> but that, that's a good that's a good picture to paint because um I want to kind of stay in that time period though because I do like to get even though life and time ain't linear, I like to get a little linear flow of uh the story of the uh career and everything like that so in high school you both started producing and DJing at the same time you said right um before I kind of keep that timeline going on I didn't touch an, I didn't touch enough upon this when I brought it up earlier how specifically did the relationship of being a new producer ish in a sense and you know a new DJ in a sense at the same time influence one another like I feel like that's a lot of like you know young creative energy to be bouncing off yeah, totally, man. Um, you know, it's interesting that you you picked up on like the synchronicity of those relationships mm -hmm. because that was something that like very early on became apparent where what I was doing on the DJ boards would like directly help my next song. You know what I mean? Mm. So so rather than it being like two separate skill sets that were I had to like make sure I divided equal energy into, I would just get lost in DJing for a few months and not really produce very much and come back to DJing. I mean, come back to producing with all this sick knowledge about mm. like, okay, these types of drum grooves are really rocking the crowd right now. Mm. And, and same way with like producing, like I might get lost in producing for a few months and mm. like maybe not like in the winter time, I think I probably made like, 10 songs this week like nice. i've made <laughs> made so many songs this Hell week yeah. you know Hell yeah. um and when i go back to djing i'll i'll have a like a new type of feel to it mm. maybe something where like i'm looking for more like deep <clears throat> deep grooves um but yeah i feel like they complement each other so well and then audio engineering definitely I, I started i started working as an audio engineer after after high school, kind of after DJing, um, I really started like working for this band Sugarbox. I've heard of them, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like a '90s cover band, um, and they do probably like they're local, right? They're lo they're local, yeah. yeah. And they probably do like a hundred shows a year or something. Damn. And you know, everybody in that band has like a bunch of instruments, so it was it was a pretty complicated sound engineering setup and. It taught me a lot, you know, just like the, those three things are really like a trifecta that work together. And it's, yeah. it's, it's honestly the ultimate, it really is the ultimate bundle. Cause as a producer, you have to DJ. Mm -hmm. That's how you play your music out. That's true. You know, you're doing like a live set somewhere. You have to, you know, as a producer, you have to be a good audio engineer. Mm. If you can't mix your own records, like you're not really that much of a producer because so much of what it is is being able to mix your records like you don't have to do all of it but you know that's the big part of it nowadays mm. is like can you make the kick drum and the bass slap hard yeah like <laughs> you want to like have the finished product sound like it's edited well you know yeah totally man good i want i wanted to kind of get into that timeline because um when did you first start producing what like specific age were you kind of like doing dj matt perry so to speak right well when i was like when i first started producing i definitely didn't have the name dj matt perry at least um i think i was going by romulus mm -hmm. like from like rome Roman okay. times okay um and i had like a little electronic record label called team rome in high school and there was like a handful of artists we were all just friends making music basically yeah um and that i think we put out an album called squares and hershey kiss squares and hershey kisses in 2012 like right before the world ended yeah yeah yeah. like december 20th or something like yeah, that right, right before the mayans <laughs> just in case you know what i mean we need to get an album out yeah they were 10 years after they meant 2022 so stay tight folks uh oh I mean, all the shit that's been ramping up the past couple of years, man. Don't you feel something? I'm just, I, I'm just kidding, y'all. Stay, I always stay get tricked. Positive, I man. always get tricked by the apocalypse, bro. Like every once in a while, I'm like, all right, it's gonna happen. <laughs> I mean, you don't even know, man. There's so much shit happening around us that we can't even see. We can't see like what eighty percent of like the universe that we've captured with satellites, or like the rays, gamma rays, UV can't rays, all that ocean. stuff. 
What do you mean we can't? I can see the ocean. It's well, not today. Not, not, <laughs> not, not very deep. That you know I, what I'm yeah, saying? Meta- metaphorically speaking. Yeah, it's like we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, we don't know what's in there. Like the Titanic. So you were. Um, did you have any other names before DJ Matt Perry? Or did you go right to DJ Matt Perry after that? So, it, I think it was Romulus and then BC. Like before, before. Yeah, and BC was kind of when I started releasing stuff after high school i became bc because i was interested in duality and non-duality the two letters like before christ and shit basically before common era it's it's spelled like two words um like b-e space Mm s-e and and basically it means like being matt seeing benny and then that inherently just brings you to the thought of non-duality sort of like it's a good pointer right so my name was like a pointer for non-duality what's non-duality i guess non-dual non non non-duality is like because duality is like two things yeah in in the same yeah so with non-duality right you have uh you know republicans and democrats or whatever you have on and off, left and right, black and white. Oh, in a sense, maybe not like, is, is it different than binary? I think of like type it's A It's like and binary, type B. Yep. It's like you can't put everything into just an A or B could. Yep. Better phrase is gray over you. Life isn't just fucking one thing or the other. This infinite. Totally. The context is so relevant. And and one thing I like to think about too is in that binary relationship, it, it has to exist inside of something. Mm-hmm. So there's a void that's inherently allowing these things to exist or... These things are existing inside this void because without these things, there would be a void. Language is so wild. bro. And, and, and that ultimately is, I think what non-duality is trying to point towards mm. and it helps you just not get trapped in your stupid brain. Yeah. You know what I, I mean? I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. You can't box everything into just like specific categories themselves. Yeah. Especially existence as a whole. All right. Well, enough me- metaphysical talk. Um, because we're probably, I know we're just based on the vibe of this shit. We're going to have some probably more before this interview concludes. But um, then was it DJ Matt Perry after BC? Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't think of a name, honestly. So just, and you're a big friend of, or you're a big fan of Friends, the show. So you adopted. Well, yeah. <laughs> How many fucking times did you get that joke growing up, probably? Yeah. It's still well, good. You know, I wor- when I worked as a bartender, I was I was washing dishes at a restaurant, and I eventually was able to bartend there, and... They used to call me Chandler Bing because my name's Matt Perry. And yeah, so Matt Perry's a guy I'm friends with for those who don't know. Yeah. And then his character name was Chandler Bing. And so they would just call me Chandler over there. Chandler Bing. Yeah. That's a weird name. Bro. I know, right? I didn't, I never Chandler knew that. Chandler Bing. <clears throat> well, I guess every name's kind of weird if you really think about Chan. it long enough. Yeah. But what age was this when you started going by your government name, by your um, real moniker? So I was, I was already DJing at Oasis under BC. So... Because I want to get to that, I guess. But yeah, the DJing stuff later. So yeah. I, I was, I think it was probably like twenty nineteen, maybe twenty eighteen. Mm-hmm. It was like it was kind of recent. Got you, but you, you, know? you, but regardless, you had been uploading mad beats before that on SoundCloud. And oh shit yeah, for a hot minute. Yeah, I think my SoundCloud was under BC Music for a while, and then Got shout out, you. shout out to SoundCloud. You can just change your fucking yeah. URL whenever you so want. Close. You know what I mean? So close. Um, Rebranding's a lot easier than that shit. Most. Oh my god, yeah. There's probably there's there's probably a, there might be a hundred public tracks on there. Yeah, honestly, like, I'll get to the SoundCloud too, actually, because I did mention DJing. You you said you started doing these at the same time. So like, what age? And then you start yeah. doing like, I guess, a what age did you do your first DJ set? I guess I think you mentioned a party with Pearl, something yeah, like that. Yeah, totally. And then just give me the, kind of your progression up until like you know more of the modernish era, because I remember, um, like summer twenty nineteen. Actually, it was with a homie Josh Sanchez. Josh shout out Bird Theory, and we were walking by, and we saw you DJing somewhere in town twenty nineteen. He's like, oh yeah, he's at, he's about Oasis. He's over here, blah blah blah. How did that all formulate too? Before we kind of get to the deeper producer questions. Yep. So I was introduced to DJing by my dad. That's pretty dope. And he just happened to be friends with like some of the DJs kind of. My dad's kind of just like a friendly guy. And mm. he was just like, oh, hey, like, what's up? This is my son. Like, teach him how to DJ. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, <laughs> I was just, I was shocked. I mean, it was, it was so cool. And they did actually like show me a little bit. They're like, yeah, like, you know, like you can press this button and like, here's how you mix a song or whatever. Mm, mm. And I think it, I don't know why, man, it just, it just really clicked and it was super exciting. I was, I think 17 when I, when I did my first gig 
and I organized my own party, <laughs> right? And I invited everybody in the school and the school was was sort of behind it. It was like supposed to be my senior project. And then they like bailed last minute because they didn't want to be responsible for a bunch of underage kids going to a nightclub. <laughs> yeah, it's a bad look um, for them. Shout out to Greeley High School. For them. And yeah, that that was 17 and I did that. And then I did like three shows that year, I think. I organized three shows nice. and, and um, did all the promotion for them and brought everybody there and everything. Mm-hmm. And then, then I did a 21 plus show at Pearl on a Tuesday night when I was like, 17 years old and nobody came because like i didn't know anybody who was 21 yeah and that was like my first like you know like horrible defeat it i was i I had like three you know three great shows and then the fourth one was just like total failure the the club was pissed um but yeah i mean that happens man (laughs) hell yeah so where'd you go after that then were you um still like rocking local places for the most part I th- after so after that I I went sort of more into producing for a f- couple years. I didn't really have any DJ opportunities um to be honest. I I was trying to I was trying to get gigs and I was working for like a video production company doing some audio work mm. um in in college and I just didn't nothing really was like clicking. It was kind of in that era where I don't think I was really very skilled <clears throat> and maybe I was a little overconfident. Yeah. And that can happen. As yeah. A youth. And I had to, At any age, I had to really get a lot more skilled. Um, mm. and during that time period, I made a lot of bad music too. Like yeah. just like a ton of beats that were for some reason they weren't gluing together. Or like this one part wasn't right. Or like, I would be hype about it. And then I like show my friend and they're like, eh, well, I don't know. Like maybe this part mm-hmm. could not be there. Um, and I got, I started working as a dishwasher at a restaurant and eventually worked as a bartender. And at that bar, I heard, I overheard someone talking about being the owner of sticks. Yep. Which in sticks was a club. Sticks was like a huge nightclub in town. And I was like, holy shit, this guy's the owner. And I, so I became friends with him and eventually he let me be a bartender there. And I, I eventually was able to DJ at sticks while I was bartending. So it was kind of just like curating the playlist, but I think I was yeah. 20, 20 years old or 21 then. Gotcha. Um, and I was like, I was making like 10 bucks a night, fucking broke as shit. But just DJing like, too. But, but <laughs> DJing and I was so stoked. I remember getting paid like 125 bucks one time for DJing uh, a night. And it just shocked me, man. I was like, I told my dad, I was like, dad, I made like 125 bucks. Like, you know, and he's like, that's not shit. Like, <laughs> you're fucking broke, you dumbass. I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> but it's cool, so. you know. And um, n- now it's definitely different. But it, it made a, it made a huge difference to me just to be paid that first time. And you're out in the scene a little bit more. It's yeah. a bigger place. Yeah, way bigger. That can kind of get you better looks to get other gigs, potentially. Dude, and you know what, man? It was like, I felt like... The nightclubs were just falling under my feet, right? Because I was working at Sticks, and then Sticks closed. They mm-hmm. went out of business. And then I was working at Studio 55, and they closed. They went out of business. Yep. And then I was working at Mark's Place. On and, 4, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Mark's Place on 4th Street. And then I started working at Oasis. Yeah, then, um, that's exactly where I, like, I remember hearing your name first. Like You were the one of the resident DJs there, yeah. I believe. Yeah, and I, I played a lot of times outside on the patio at Oasis, also upstairs in the club um played at pearl on thursday nights eventually i had Mm -hmm. you know i was doing probably three three gigs a week in in portland like occasionally i might do a set of flask yeah or like i was also i was working with brie lane a lot then too and we were playing shows around like some of the bigger uh music festivals like river jam um we played the pride uh, Mm. fest here which was super cool and that I, yeah. And the DJing stuff at Oasis was like, again, I, my first gig there, man, let me just describe this. I parked way too far away. It oh, was carrying freezing everything? cold out. Oh, I'm carrying all no. my gear and my, I'm not like the strongest guy ever, but my, my hand started like failing on me cause it was mm. like really cold. And so I was walking and I was not trying to let go, but my gear kept dropping out of my hands cause it was so fucking cold. And I parked like 10 blocks away. I didn't know what I was doing. I get to Oasis. The first thing the owner says to me, I walk in the door. He's like, you better not play any of that fucking rave music. I was like planning on playing only rave music. Oh, man. 
<laughs> oh man <laughs> i show up i'm like exhausted i'm starting like, off rough holy fuck okay well you ended up fucking doing that place habitually so i guess it was a turn of events from that night. It, it worked out <laughs> i didn't play any rave music thank god i listened to him yeah. you know and it just you know I, I played some cool stuff and i eventually just you i think really you mean, just man? you just keep like you know learning what the crowd wants a lot of it is they want to sing along with stuff they already know yeah especially older crowds that are there like or, the, or younger crowds too you know it's like as much as they do want to be introduced to new stuff at the yeah. club they want it to be like a new remix mm-hmm. of a song they already That's know. That's a good point. I'm not even thinking, I'm not because then they're not probably mouthing as the words. Like, I think older people, they're going to dance and shit, but you get a lot of people that kind of sit down, have a drink, get some food even maybe, and they kind of like sing the songs and shit they know. Yeah, I feel like younger motherfuckers want to go out and dance, but then when you play... Like you said, remixes of songs they know. That that's when it goes off. That that's when because it's like familiarity, but with a twist. Yeah. Like all right, let's, I want to dance now, motherfucker. Yo, fucker. if you're if you're a upcoming DJ or producer, um, or even if you're already on, that is a gem. Putting out remixes of songs yeah. is one of the best ways to get uh, traction in your career. I think about I only knew Steve Aoki's name in high school for the first time because he remixed Pursuit Kid of Cuddy. Happiness. Fuck yeah. And I was like, wow, like I love this Kid Cudi song. This is, um, And this is like pre-Project X, too. Um, I'm like, this is actually is very interesting. What an interesting take. And then I, I still know who Steve Aoki is because of that song. The remix, dude. Yeah. It's very interesting. All right, well, I want to keep talking about um, DJing and maybe what, maybe what you're doing now with it and maybe anything else like that. But I kind of want to pivot back to the growth of a producer, if that makes sense. Cool. I wanted to talk about um, producer Matt Perry. Obviously, your name's DJ Matt Perry. We got to spend a couple of minutes talking about the DJ shit here. But when I go back to that SoundCloud uh, that we mentioned, I mean, we're going to 2014, 15-ish, 16-ish probably. You've been putting out beats and collabing with a lot of fellow podcast guests like Trelly, Hannah Harleen, I saw, Jimmy the Human, Shane Rise, Angelica, Genius Black, to name us, just a couple. And I really feel like in 2020 and in 2021, I really saw or heard more so a tightening of your sound. Not only in that, but also in adverse effects as well, which is you and Sean Greer. I got some funny stories about Sean Greer that I hope I can say. Is he he got like an important job or anything or is he like a chill dude about what he does in his social life? Sean's super chill, yeah. Sweet. I got some funny weed stories with with Sean (laughs) Greer. I I gotta say at some point too when we start talking about adverse effects. But to kind of encapsulate um, this soliloquy here, when do you really feel like you started to tighten up? Because I don't even like that because that infers like it wasn't always tight. But when did you start to really like form this current sound you think you have as a producer? Yeah, it definitely was not with me in the beginning. That's for sure. Mm. Um, I I feel pretty recent that I've made an internal decision and externally said it out loud um to to really only work on one artist project Mm. um and that has helped a lot with with narrowing the focus on adverse effects um collabing for me right now looks a lot like me working to support an artist and that works great, mm-hmm. right? Like doing audio engineering or mixing someone's record. Um, like for Angelica, I've been doing uh, a lot of mixing and mastering for her. And for Genius Black, we um, produced records, you know, sort of in in a together vein, but mm-hmm. also his his sound. Yeah, yeah. Um, same way with Jimmy the Human. When he came through my studio, like I made a record for him. Mm-hmm. Um in in those in those environments it's like i'm trying to almost embody the artist mm-hmm. and like be like what are they looking for you know maybe maybe what they have online probably isn't what they're looking for which is kind of not what a lot of people think but if you go online and listen to an artist sound they're probably working on something different yeah which took me a while to figure that out <laughs> um but you know, it's it's hard, man. I, I so much so want to invest in all these new artists that I that I listen to and like I want to make records with them mm. and and help jumpstart people's careers and like do things like that. Just collab, you know. And 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 so much of that is about collabing and also so much of it is about 
focusing and being able to tough part. provide the value with at, at least one larger brand. Because after the record's done, getting the marketing and the branding is really tough mm-hmm. to make it pop. Um, not everyone has that side of them where they feel like they can do that in a sense too. Yeah. Like I know a lot of artists, even myself included, where it's like sometimes you just don't want to fucking like market and like brand or like make content. It's just like a really tough balance, I think, in the modern digital age to stay. Um, not stay, but like just to put your name out there. It's 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 a quandary sometimes. Dude, a hundred percent, man. And the marketing stuff is is tough, and it's important, and it's like in some ways it can be like menial Mm. and um i found myself doing a lot of that with a lot of people and like getting halfway done with an album or something so i don't know i i i did make like a specific decision yeah last year basically to to stop uh collaborating with new artists I know it sounds so shitty. <laughs> it's, hey, it's saying it out hey, loud. Sounding pretty nice. Like, you know, fuck, fuck them kids. It sounds so fucked up, but I, the reason why I'm doing it is because I don't have mm. as much to offer right now as I could. Mm. If if I had a platform to put on the artist, that way when they feature on one of my songs, they get a lot of views and traction. Mm-hmm. That's what I want, um, and so that's what I'm trying to build. And right even now, so, you know? I mean, not to rub, but like you're not like probably never gonna do collaboration again you're just taking your time to work on things you're very invested in as a solo artist and also if you're, you're being a liar because you collab with somebody very talented like we just said sean greer right with adverse effects and that's what i really want to talk about now too because adverse effects is dope from the music from the visuals just from um you know they will be wearing jumpsuits and going to like peaks island and shit right like it's just interesting to see how you guys are just creating together out here um We've touched upon it. I believe we touched upon the name. It's AD versus FX. But can you kind of break down initially um, how you and Sean's relationship as friends and neighbors then became an actual like named act, if that makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, we played a gig on the Portland Media Center. It mm-hmm. used to be called Community Television Network. Um, and it was supposed to just be us like jamming kind of just like i was gonna play some beats and sean was gonna jam on guitar and we didn't have the adverse effects name then but he plugged his guitar into my dj board and Mm. i started putting effects on it and they're dj effects so it sounds kind of weird but that motion right there when sean first plugged his guitar into my dj board was when adverse effects was really really in that one in that one in that moment (laughs) because we had never like a lot of people know what a guitar sounds like. Mm-hmm. People know what a DJ does. But when you blend the two together, your mind kind of can yeah. go a little wild, right? And you blend genres too, because I feel like there's a lot of electronic sounds, there's a lot of rock sounds, there's some hip hop sounds, you know, some percussion. Um, it's just all over the place, very explosive. Um, and I imagine this was probably just like a conscious choice, but also just a natural choice, probably at the same time, right? Totally, man. Yeah, for whatever reason. Sean and I love like urban exploring mm-hmm. in like old abandoned buildings and factories and stuff. Nice. Um, sometimes trespassing, sometimes not. Allegedly. Allegedly, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that that stuff makes its way into the sound, mm. and it it just kind of you know Sean's a punk. Like Sean doesn't want to make. Sean knows exactly how to make beautiful perfectly formulated music he yeah. like studied jazz theory and everything. he's on the collage uh, track too on Bial's yeah, album so Bial's good. EP he has the, the, if you've anyone like knows the song collage by Bial like there's a guitar outro I believe on that it's, yeah. it's Sean Greer who does that yeah. so good came out so cool and yeah one thing adverse effects in that moment it was the sound became this affected thing and that's we still do that to this day like very heavily in our in our stuff yeah um and then it, we actually came up with this name Chillverse Effects, which was like chill chill stuff in, in effects. <laughs> um, and we played like some random like office parties and shit like that. It was kind of funny. Huh. Um, and eventually we settled on the hazmat suits. I don't even know where the heck those came from. I think, you know, I think we might have gotten them just to like protect ourselves from asbestos urban exploring that makes sense and like it was just like a utility thing and we had masks too to protect ourselves from asbestos poisoning Mm -hmm. um 
And then they were sick photos, and we were like, well, maybe yeah, we should, like, well. brand with this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you, just, you, just run, you just run with it at that point. Yeah. How did that uh, Metamorphosis EP come together? Oh, man. Because I remember seeing a set at the Portland Zoo, and I believe... Did you, did you, was there an album party there? I can shout out Josh. I think Josh Hand hit me up. To, or I hit him up and I went to that. Or some, whatever the story is, I was there. And I think there was a resample that night, too. Because I remember there was like an electricity in the air. For me, at least. There always is an electricity. I know I'm going to hit up Tiki for a resample. But I remember I was at the zoo. It was a sunny-ass day. And there was someone singing. And I'm pretty sure that there were two other people performing. Yep. We, we, and you were there that day, too? Yep. Yeah, see, they, this is funny. That's why I like doing this podcast. Because I don't even know who you were. But I was listening to something you were doing because it's such a small fucking town. You kind of like overlap with people all the time and you don't even know who they are. Totally. So, that was so much fun. Yeah. How did that EP come together? Because that's, that's a good EP for people to want to get into. Um, I think a lot of dope elements of your sound on, Thanks, on like streaming and shit. So working with Tally Grow on that project started off by her. She reached out to me out of the blue saying that she wanted to make music and she had remembered she remembered meeting me somewhere at like a producer meetup and hearing my sound which i did not think i had anything cool to offer but yeah tally grow and i started working together and then i brought sean in to help do some melodic parts mm-hmm. um and and it ended up being such a synergy and just like working with tally grow is so cool mm-hmm. um that we made like a whole a whole a whole album out of it and at that time i was interning at acadia recording company yeah yeah, yeah. And so they ended up mixing and mastering the record, which was super sick. Mm-hmm. And and those guys, shout out to Todd Hutchinson and Pat Keen over at Acadia. Uh, they're both incredible engineers and just mm-hmm. like super awesome humans. So th- that project was so much fun. And Josh Hand did the the video for it. It's on YouTube. You can yep. see it. And like I have that he Josh. Shout out to Josh. He is so clever. Um, and, and making the artwork with him was so much fun too. Like Josh is the type of dude who you can be weird around and it like feels good. You know, Josh got a hella weird in him too. Yeah. yeah, Josh is (laughs) I say that as as like all love too. Cause I mean like the best artists that I know have a good amount of weird. weird, Yeah. Gotta have that. It's part of your unique vibration as a being. Dude. And actually we have a new adverse effects song coming out on the 31st of January. We just dropped one last week Mm -hmm. as well. Um, and we're kind of on the, we're putting the pedal to the metal right now and like trying to drop at least a song a month. Fuck yeah. Which is, you know, a re- reasonable pace. Yeah. So that. I definitely, I definitely want to talk about that. I think I want to, um, get to that and kind of j- what you're working on, what's to come, but I have a couple shout outs and then I want to kind of do a rapid fire segment and then kind of conclude with a stay tuned. This is what we be doing type vibes. So that's cool with you. Sounds great, man. All right. So shout outs I want to say is, um. Did Adverse Effects do an interview with DJ Jai from WMPG? Oh my, yes. Yes, dude. Uh, is that Rob, right? I, I forget DJ Rob, Jai's yeah. government name. It's Rob. It's Rob. <clears throat> Man, he's awesome. Yeah, he's, I love that guy. He, Shout out to he DJ wild, Jai. Dude. I, I'm the hip hop director at WMPG and I have a weekly show. Mondays, 10 p.m. Eastern time, you can tune into Ryan Beat Radio. Only on WMPG, WMPG.org. Regardless though, uh, we had a, uh, Jai and I had when I used to when I was putting in my licks and doing the eleven thirty show. Jai was there before me a couple times doing sub shit. Jai pulls DJ Jai pulls up to a two, not even that like an hour radio set harder than most motherfuckers I've seen pull up for it like a set at a venue for a crowd. He brings like two to three crates of records <laughs> and then there's a two turntable um setup that you can stream to the radio and he live mixed um the <laughs> the records on air i remember i was in there there's two dj jazz toys i had to stay on this podcast because i saw you were interviewed by him I'm like i have to like these stories involving them are, are too good to not say on some wax and put them on record i'm in the studio he's playing some shit this is actually at 1 30 in the morning excuse me the first time i met him he was subbing for someone after me dj jai puts on the instrumental to Shamrocks and Shenanigans, I believe, by House of Pain. Oh. Speeds it up. Then he puts on, um, I believe, a Coolio song. I forget the song. The acapella of it. I hear the drum kick of this House of Pain song. I didn't recognize it as an OG version. I'm like, 
this sounds like fucking like James Brown tempo. It was like boom, bam, 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 boom, bam, bam, bam. I'm like, this is fucking sick. I'm like, what is this? Is this fucking like some James Brown jump or like Clyde Stubblefield? Stubblefield, I forget on their name. Excuse me. Um, one of the best drummers of all time. Uh, is it like one of his breaks? He's like, no. Um, this is Shamrocks and Shenanigans by House of Pain sped up. I'm like, what the fuck? And then the Coolio part kicks on. And at this point, I'm like, this is one of the dopest mashups I've heard in so long. And you would only hear this at this time currently on WMPG or if you were the um, foresight or hindsight, I guess, to go to the archives and listen to it after it was streamed. But he ain't putting that on SoundCloud. Like, there's not like some DJ Jive mix. I like that shit so much. I screen recorded it. And then I saved it as an audio file, and I sent it to myself on my phone. That way I can always have it. Like, I still play that song that DJ Jai played on the radio that one time habitually. So shout out DJ Jai for that. And the power of, like, artists doing dope shit is so important because you never know what moment could have an impact. Like, I don't think he knew that I'd be talking about that mashup right now on my podcast. I'm probably going to play that song tonight and dance a little bit. You got to send me it, bro. Yeah, I want to hear it's it. It's hard. I'll play it after this. Um... The second DJ Josh short. I'll keep this one short because I can get on a little run here because I love radio shit. Um, I'm at the station. This time he slept for someone in front of me. Snowstorm had ended. Driveway's pretty fucked at WMPG. I got a car with good tires and wheel drive and shit like that. So I was set. I think he was in some sedan. He's trying to get out. He's trying to get out. I'm looking to the to the right and I see him in the driveway and he's stuck. And then he starts calling the station. He's like, "Hey, it's Jai. I'm stuck. Can you help me?" I'm like, "Jai, I'm on the air right now. <laughs> dude. How the fuck am I gonna help you? <laughs> what do you mean? I can't just leave the radio. Like you of all people know this." And he's like, "No, nah, we can prop the we can prop like a door. So we can figure something out." So I'm like, "I right, I gotta be meticulous with my timing. I pick like, you know, I try and cue like 20 minutes in a row of music to like be, have the perfect flow." Hit the queue, run right outside. Try and get him out. We're sweating and like we're, we're oh trying to we're trying to God. get this motherfucking car out. And it's this like weird part where the um, driveway's a hill and um that goes down and the street we're on going uphill. So it's like literally like like a little like um cave you're pretty much or not like a cavern I guess or like a a divot you're in so to speak that you can't get out of. And he's just revving it and the tires spinning slush everywhere on my shoes and shit. I'm like, I'm on the fucking radio. No one's in the station right now. This is stupid as fuck. In a good way. Run back inside because I couldn't get him out the first time. Pick 20 more minutes of music. Run back outside. End up getting him unstuck while I'm still on the radio. He's like, thank you, Benny. Thank you, Benny. Skirts out of there. I run back inside, like lock up. And like the show went on without a hitch. So uh, oh when I think of DJ God. Jai, I think of that remix and of maybe my favorite memory at WMPG ever. Dude, this, I, this I got minute. one short one to, yeah, yeah, to yeah, share no, with DJ Jai. This is what the podcast is yeah. for. <laughs> Dude, I was doing a DJ residency at 555 Congress. It's the glass thin building across from Port yeah, City Music Hall. used to have the point. Yeah, we used to have yeah. the main center for electronic music in there. I was running that. Oh, shit. Sure. And... He came in to the, to the DJ session and like we had open mic kind of thing and he grabs the mic. I'm playing some super hard music. I think it was actually like this fast house song by Zed that was like really aggressive. And, and he starts doing these like bird hybrid like sound effects like offbeat on the drop. He's like, doo, 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 bow! and he, it was the sickest like. I've never heard yeah, anybody yeah. like do anything like that before. Is he the singularity? But he he might be. He might he be. He might be the walking. Every single point of universal existence has been concaved into that human as they walk throughout this transcendental unified field of life. Shout out DJ Magical Jai. unicorn. Yeah, DJ Jai. Is, I'm gonna show you that song. Also, shout out um Graphic Melee. I think you heard stereo. Um. Dreams set that was lit. Stereo yeah. Dreams is cool. Shout out Graphic Mail. I like seeing always his producers put on for other producers. And I also want to shout out Christina Katijian, another mm-hmm. 207 legend. I'm pretty sure we met at a Christigi. Christigi, it's pretty funny. That's Christina I- Katijian music video shoot for the first time. I think that's the first time I met you. So again, I like all these stories because there's so many cool artists out here that just intertwine and create these fields and different, you know, atomic clouds of interaction and networking. That's really cool. Let's get to the motherfucking rapid fire, though. DJ Matt Perry, what's your favorite breakfast? Homemade juice. What about like a fit? No, nah, that's a great answer. I was gonna say, what about like a physical food? But juice is a food. Homemade juice, too, man. Yeah. Like like freshly squeezed with like two whole apples, 
one cucumber, one whole lemon, like a thumb size of ginger. Oh, you got to. Plus a bunch of carrots and beets. And like that will electrify your entire life. You'll be fucked. I try and have ginger in like a shake every morning, to be honest. So I good. love ginger. Favorite time of day to produce? I love the morning time. Yeah, for sure. Major lesson you've learned the last few years? That context is everything. Dream place to do a DJ set? Man, fucking Antarctica. Could happen. No, I think adverse effects show in Antarctica would be fucking... Be lit. Be pretty wild. What's a favorite song that you've made? The one that I'm dropping on the 31st is called Like This. Nice. It's, by, it's an adverse effects song. It's it, it's my best work for sure. Um, I'm just super hyped to drop it. And this inspired, this honestly, bro, your show helped inspire me to like pump out some more music. How so? Because I knew I would have an opportunity oh, to, you're to coming on something. This, yeah. Nice. Hell yeah. That's what we're here for, yo. Everyone out there, you know, we're here to keep everyone going on in their own pace in their own way allegedly and because i'm mad inspired by what everyone else does that's why i do what i do seeing people drop seeing people post about what they're doing and even more so just like thinking about like oh how do they approach this that's what really motivates me back to you Hmm. a favorite portland food spot hmm Uh, marcy's diner yeah that's i like marcy's diner they're they're very tasty. 207 collab you still want to cook up, even though I think earlier on the record you said, <laughs> fuck every artist in the state of Maine. I'm never doing a collaboration ever again. I might have to redact that. It could be incorrect. Um, Favorite 207 collab? Or no, like one you still want to do. One, one I want to do. I guess do. if you don't oh, want to yeah. answer that, you could say your favorite one, though. Um... You know, I would love to collab with OHX. You know those guys? OHX. I think they, they're, I think it's like a producer duo. I don't know that much about them. They, they've done like a few records. I don't know. Um, I've never heard of them. They're nasty. Unless bro. I'm, I've listened to it and I, like, I'm a good visual person and an audible person. Sometimes names don't stick it's, with me. Yeah, it's three letters, OHX. It doesn't ring a bell. They have though. a song called The Future. It's fucking sick. I gotta check it out. Summer, fall, winter, or spring. I think fall is my favorite. I always write my best songs in fall for some reason. Nice. You got to move to another country. Where are you going? Kenya. Album you take with you to your grave. Hmm. Maybe Random Access Memories by Daft Punk. It's a good one. we going full circle. And you survived, yo. Yahoo. I put more O's in my notes for the Yahoo, so I kind of want to actually do the Yahoo. There we go. I want to now use this time for you to potentially talk about anything you're currently working on because adverse effects might have some shit dropping soon, it sounds like. Yeah, dude. The adverse effects project is in full swing. I, we just dropped the <clears throat> website. Um, th- we're dropping TikTok content more regularly and more instagram content uh youtube content a lot of long form Mm. like more shows um yeah adverse effects is definitely just the the plug right now it's six letters a d v s f x it's not adverse effects like the adverse effects of the medication may cause short-term memory loss no it's a d what is that is that like um like an audio thing, like audio verse effects, or am I, am I tripping? So, what is it? Okay, so the the name, at least w- we pronounce it adverse effects. Yeah, ex- exactly. The AD- Just like the two words. Yeah, but like, are they? Um, but it's spelt like six letters, and it has sort of two meanings. Because it's verses, it looks like it's like. Yeah, like one a fight. is like when Sean and I are performing, he's a lot of times adding sound, and I'm affecting it. So that's ad. Effects. That makes kind sense. Of. All right. Yeah, That's yeah. kind of what's it's, going it's on. It's a loose interpretation. Also, I, I think it was just like the name itself in the fa- – we also make uh, stuff. We utilize the tritone in our music a lot and 
dissonance in our music a lot. And there's a lot of dissonance. And that stuff ends up, for whatever reason, feeling really fucking good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, it matches the, the, the... You know, it just, like, it, the adverse synergy. effects, ironically, is, like, this positive brand. And, like, we do, like, yoga before our shows and shit. Yeah, like, yeah. in the bathroom, Sean and I are, like, doing, like, little, like, poses and stretches, trying to, like, get our, get our chakra up. Yeah. Exactly. I like that. So, shout out Adverse Effects. You dropping very soon. Stay tuned for that. You said um, website, too. Yeah. It's good. You should have your own website, yo, because Instagram and all this shit ain't going to be around forever. Yeah, hell you, yeah. You need your own site. That's smart. Um, what about DJing? You, DJ Matt Perry, you still you still DJ anything? Or? So... Right now, I mean, I so I work at a recording studio, and we just got a new space in mm. Portland. Mm. It's called Black Owl Studios. It's on Vanna Ave. Where's Vanna Ave? Is that like it's it's on Woodford's Corner oh, by the Bayou Kitchen? Yeah, that sounds and, like Forest to me. So yeah, um, Oriental Sun Market and that oh, shitty little there. Dunkin' Donuts. There's a shitty little Dunkin' right there. Um, and so allegedly, th- that's a like a, a full scale video audio production Ooh. studio. Um, I, mean, I guess you are DJing. I didn't mean to be disrespectful too, because you are DJing in adverse effects. Yeah, I'm just thinking like more like solo endeavors. You yeah, know, like. but but that's I'm I'm sort of cutting out the solo endeavors because inherently every Friday night that I go out and DJ a show means that I'm not finishing a record or working on something for adverse effects. That's true. And like I also so I, I want to shout out. Uh, Kato on the track, mm-hmm. and also DJ Payne One, who are two of my mentors. I've been mentoring DJ with Payne for six One. Years. He's dropping an album with Soul, I think, in February. Oh shit! Dude. I could be tripping. Had that they, that DJ, makes total sense. They've worked together. They've before, worked right? together before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure there's a new Soul and DJ Payne One album coming. Dude, because he's DJ Payne One has been collaborating with everybody, bro. He's yeah. been doing so many huge records. Um, but shout out to those guys because I've been mentoring with them for six years. Nice. And are they both from Maine? No, it's online yeah, mentorship. Like, Shit, yeah, because that yeah. sounds like... Kato's from Atlanta, and DJ Payne One's from Madison. And Wisconsin? Yeah. Shout out to Kalahari Resort, if anyone's ever heard of that. Right? And and those guys have honestly helped kind of train me and, and give me the right perspective on, like, they they, they take their internet brands very seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're they're focused on creating high-quality content, you know, Rhyme beat too, honestly, man. I think you know you're crushing it out here. Like, Thanks, real, shout, out, shout out to Rhyme beat. Thanks. And yeah, I just want to shout out to Kato and DJ Payne. Want to appreciate you guys. Shit, hell yeah. So I mean, you steady work, and even if you're not uh, curating, I mean, it's we're in a pandemic too. So like I said, it makes sense. You're not like curating, you know, a Friday night DJ set. You put in those stripes, and now it could be something you go back to. But for now, you want to keep on cooking up this fresh adverse effects energy. Hell yeah, Sean Greer's story. I guess I'll condense this one because as much as I like to elaborate and articulate a nice long story, sometimes if you can just pinpoint the meaning of a story in like a poignant sentence, that's just as good. So long story short, I think in two separate occasions, I've been outside a venue with some homies pre-pandemic time smoking. Sean Greer comes up. I'm like, hey, what's up? You want to hit? You in the circle? He's like, yeah, sure, I'll take one. <laughs> Both times. He's then said, I was just, you know, not in like the best headspace I wanted to be. And I took that one hit and I had an amazing show. So thank you, man. And I'm like, that's what it's about. That's what we do as a community. We take care of each other. Nice, dude. That's important. Oh, um, man, that's so shout out Sean Greer. Shout out Adverse Effects. Shout out DJ Matt Perry. Um, to those of you at home, I don't know if you can tell. There was a couple technical difficulties that we finessely handled, smoothly got through. So I'm proud of that. Thanks at home, too, for waiting for so long. If it felt like a while to you. Um, I do love doing these interviews, but, you know, A, you don't want to burn out of things you love, and it's okay to take some time to articulate how you want to move forward with your artistic goals and plans. And second, we in a fucking pandemic, B. We got that Omerion variant. I was out for a hot minute. We had people, um, we had to cover work shifts for people, man. It's just a lot. It's a, it's a lot. We got a lot of people here. It's not just me. There's people behind the camera you can't even see smiling and killing it. So, um. Shout out everyone for listening, always. Shout out y'all for waiting for this podcast. If you were, shout out Twigs, always. Shout out Twigs. And then shout out, um, actually, is Willow Picks the Bennis brand? Is that, yeah, yeah. Shout out Willow, Willow Picks, W-I-L-L-O-P-I-X.com. Close enough. Close enough. 
figure it out. We'll follow the socials. Figure it out. <laughs> um, but now I want to end the Matt Perry story. Um, not the Friends finale. I had to say that joke. I'm sorry. Um, DJ Matt Perry, before we ask this last question, is there anything in life you're just looking forward to you want to shout out on a positive tip? Could be, you know, an event that's coming up, just something you're enjoying currently in your life that you're looking to see go, like a movie that's coming out. I don't know. Just anything that's like, you're really like, fuck, like I'm excited when I wake up and think about this. Yeah, I last year with Angelica threw a little mini music festival at our house. Nice. And we're doing it again this year, and it's uh, it's going to be a live stream only festival. And it's just like there's so many exciting variables, like the stage is in the woods, and it's like very cool. uh, vibey, surrounded by the trees and all the, yeah, the yeah. greens and everything. So I'm really excited about that. That's Maybe awesome. Mini yeah. music festival we're going to throw. That sounds like a beautiful occasion. I'll be sure to uh, promote that for you as well. So that's what we do. That's what we got to do in the community. In the community, I know I've had a good po- <laughs> I know I've had a good podcast because I start like smiling internally and talking too fast, and then I find that power of higher consciousness, and you kind of just breathe, and everything slows down. Because now we're at the final question, the question we ask everybody, maybe the most important question, in setting forth your future. DJ Matt Perry, actually, I'm lying. Do you want to plug any, like, business shit, like, emails, socials, where can you reach you, where can you send money to me, <laughs> shit like that before I ask this question? Um, I would just say I just want to plug AdverseEffects.com, and if you if you want to sign up for the form on the website, that would be super sick. That's probably the best way to, to support us because then we directly have your contact information. Gotcha. And so we're no longer reliant on a large corporation – to deliver the yeah, message. you're in the new newsletter club, the email club. Yeah, so if you guys club. go to AdverseEffects.com and sign up for our texting list or our email list, would be sick. Hell yeah, sweet. All business obligations aside, it is now time for the final question. DJ Matt Perry, where will you be one year from now? Taking a deep breath. It's always good. Releasing new electronic music, uh, playing lots of live shows, hopefully on the internet, and nice. doing maybe more Twitch stuff, and yeah, more more internet stuff. More internet stuff. All right, yo. It's been a fun podcast. Thanks again for listening, waiting. Being patient. Thanks again for chilling. Shout out Willow Picks. Shout out Conversation. Shout out Life. Above all, yo, shout out Yardy Ting. And we out.